Thank you everybody for coming down to this uh, very different kind of space to have a philosophy conference in. Uh, as you know, this is kind of a protest location um, because of the strike, but it's also been, I think, a, a, had a positive aspect to it also. I mean, uh, the conference that we've been, uh, the, the topics we've been discussing, discussing have been philosophy and waste. This has been a rather perfect kind of atmosphere uh, to be uh, thinking about eco ecology and uh, trash and things like that. Um, and I, again, really appreciate you guys actually coming down uh, and making the trip here. Um, Timothy Morton is a professor of literature and the environment at the University of California in Davis. As you'll soon find from his accent, he hails from England. He did his PhD work at Oxford. Morton has published nine books and over 60 articles on topics ranging from the philosophy of food to Buddhism, from quantum mechanics to William Blake, from ecology to black metal, which of course <laughs> are not distinct. Uh, indeed, Morton's thought is infused with a profound sense of the intimacy between objects that we habitually treat as distinct, both objects out there and the object that we so casually think of as the out there, nature. This intimacy with objects is achieved with an adjusting perspective, which I might describe as telescopic, if there were such a thing as a telescope that was also an Ouroboros that uh, from time to time <laughs> seems to swallow itself. And this makes for a dizzying and vibrant read. Uh, his commitment to ecological thinking, or to thinking ecologically, and to thinking what it means to think ecologically, is not only fresh and exciting, it's necessary, given the crisis or crises, how many of them are there, uh, <laughs> that so many of us try so hard to keep out of our everyday awareness. His thought aims toward that most ambitious of goals, to be both true and to transform the world. I use scare quotes around the term world, since I suspect this is the object that he aims to make uncanny for us with intimacy this evening. I should say that earlier today, Professor Morton's true modus operandi slipped out, I think accidentally. During his presentation, he interjected into a sentence, I am a bringer of doom. <laughs> <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Professor Timothy <laughs> Thank you. No, no bringer of doom has ever been so happily introduced. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you to the Lees family. Thank you, George. And thank you especially for Nick, who deserves yet another So, um, in the ecological thought, I coined the term hyperobjects to refer to things that are massively distributed in time and space relative to humans. A hyperobject could be a black hole, a hyperobject could be the biosphere um, or the solar system. A hyperobject could be the sum total of all the nuclear materials on Earth, or just the plutonium, or just the uranium. A hyperobject could be the very long lasting product of direct human manufacture, such as styrofoam and plastic bags, or a hyperobject could be pre human or entirely non human. Biosphere, solar system. Hyperobjects then are hyper in relation to some other entity, whether they are directly manufactured by humans or not. Hyperobjects have numerous uh, properties in common. They are viscous, which means that they stick to beings that are involved with them. They are non-local. In other words, any local manifestation of a hyperobject is not directly the hyperobject. Local manifestation is philosopher Levi Bryant's term for the appearance of an object. They involve profoundly different temporalities than the human scale ones we are used to. In particular, some very large hyperobjects, such as planets, have genuinely Gaussian temporality. They generate space-time vortices due to general relativity. Hyperobjects occupy a high-dimensional phase space that results in their being invisible to humans for stretches of time, and they exhibit their effects interobjectively. That is, they can be detected in a space that consists of interrelationships between aesthetic properties of objects. Hyperobjects have already had significant impact on human, social, and psychic space. Hyperobjects, I shall argue, are directly responsible for what I call the end of the world rendering both denialism and apocalyptic environmentalism obsolete. Hyperobjects have already enforced a new human phase of hypocrisy, weakness, and lameness. I talked about weakness. I'm not going to talk about lameness, but I'm going to talk about hypocrisy um, in a minute. These terms have a very specific resonance today, and I'm going to explore the first one, hypocrisy, in as much depth as time allows. Hyperobjects are also changing human art and experience, the aesthetic dimension, what, what, uh, we are now in what I call the age of asymmetry, as I discussed earlier today. Hyperobjects 
are not just collections, systems, or assemblages of other objects. They are objects in their own right, objects in a special sense. The special sense of object derives from object-oriented ontology, an emerging philosophical movement based on revisions of Heidegger and others, and committed to a unique form of realism and non-anthropocentric thinking. Least of all, then, would it be right to say that hyperobjects are figments of the human imagination, whether we think imagination as a bundling of associations in the style of Hume, or as the possibility for synthetic judgments a priori with Kant. Hyperobjects are real, whether or not someone is thinking of them. Indeed, for reasons given in this study, hyperobjects end the possibility of transcendental leaps outside physical reality. Hyperobjects force us to acknowledge the imminence of thinking to the physical, but this doesn't mean that we are embedded in a life world. Hyperobjects thus present philosophy with a difficult double task. The first task is to abolish the idea of the possibility of a meta-language that could account for things while remaining uncontaminated by them. Post-structuralist thinking has failed to do this in some respects, or rather, it didn't complete the job. The second task is to establish what phenomenological experience is in the absence of anything meaningfully like a world at all, hence the title of my talk. The emerging ecological age gets um, the idea that there is no meta-language much more powerfully and nakedly than postmodernism ever did. Since for postmodernism everything is a metaphor in some strong sense, all metaphors are equally bad. But since there are real things for sure, just not as we know them or knew them, Jim, some metaphors are better than others. Yet because there is nowhere to stand outside of things altogether, it turns out that we know the truth of there is no meta-language more deeply than its inventors. In fact, the globalizing sureness with which there is no meta-language and everything is a metaphor in postmodernism um, are spoken means that postmodernism is nothing like what it takes itself to be and is indeed just another version of the white Western male historical project. The ultimate goal of this project, it seems, was to set up a kind of weird transit lounge outside of history in which the characters and technologies and ideas of all of the ages mill around in a state of mild, semi-blissful confusion. Slowly, however, we discovered that the transit lounge was built on Earth, which is different from saying that it was part of nature. The actual Earth, as Thoreau puts it, now contains throughout its circumference a thin layer of radioactive materials deposited in 1945. This layer marks a decisive moment in what geology now calls the Anthropocene, a geological time marked by decisive human terraforming of Earth as such. After 1945, there began the Great Acceleration, in which the geological transformation of Earth by humans increased by vivid orders of magnitude. Other significant marks begin to be laid down in 1790, when carbon from coal-fired industries began to be deposited worldwide, including in the Arctic. Think about that. A geological time, vast, almost unthinkable, juxtaposed in one word with very specific immediate things, 1790, soot, 1945, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, plutonium. This is not only a historical age, but also a geological one. Or better, we are no longer able to think history as exclusively human. For the very reason that we are in the Anthropocene. A strange name indeed, since this is the period in which non-humans make decisive contact with humans, even the ones busy shoring up differences between humans and the rest. The end of the world has already occurred. In fact, we can be uncannily precise about the date on which the world ended. Convenience is not readily associated with historiography, but in this case, it is uncannily clear. It was 1945 in Trinity, New Mexico, where the Manhattan Project tested the gadget, the first of the atom bombs, and later that year when two nuclear bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. An event of world historical importance for humans, and indeed for any life form within range of the fallout, is also a geological period, the largest scale era known on Earth. Recently, a number of philosophical approaches have arisen as if in response to the daunting, indeed horrifying, coincidence of human history and terrestrial geology. Speculative realism is the umbrella term. It's determined to break the spell that descended on philosophy since the Romantic period. The spell is known as correlationism, the notion that philosophy can only talk within a narrow bandwidth restricted to the human world correlate. Meaning is only possible between a human mind and what it thinks, its objects, flimsy and tenuous as they are. The problem is, is the light on in the fridge when you close the door? Like phenomenology, which sometimes it eschews and sometimes it embraces, speculative realism has a healthy impulse to break free of the correlationist circle, the small island of meaning to which philosophy has confined itself. It is as if, since the 17th century, thinking has been cowed by science. 
although this isn't, in fact, the case. Science not only cries out for interpretation, and heaven knows some defences of the humanities these days go as far as to argue that science needs the humanities as a kind of PR. But beyond this, science doesn't necessarily know what it's about. For a neo-Darwinist, reality is mechanisms and algorithmic procedures. For a quantum physicist, things might be very different. Reality might indeed entail a form of correlationism, such as the um, Copenhagen interpretation, which is just that. Or perhaps everything is made of mind. This is Eddington's interpretation. So which is it, right? What is it? Asleep at the switch, philosophy has allowed the default ontology to persist. There are things which are basically featureless lumps, and these things have accidental properties like cupcakes decorated with colored sprinkles. This thinking, or the lack thereof, is not unrelated to the eventual manufacture, testing and dropping of little boy and fat man. Epistemological panic is not unrelated to the sclerotic syndrome of burying the world in nullity in order to prove it. This thinking still continues despite the fact that thought has already made it irrelevant. The thinking reaches the more than merely paradoxical idea that if I can evaporate it in an atom atomic energy flash, it must be real. The thinking is acted out daily in drilling and now fracking for oil. Frack that. <laughs> the year 1900 or thereabouts witnessed a number of prequels to the realization of the Anthropocene and the coming of the Great Acceleration. These prequels occurred within human thinking itself, but it's only in retrospect that humans can fully appreciate them. Quantum theory, relativity theory, and phenomenology were all born then. Quantum theory blew a huge hole in the idea of particles as little ping pong balls. Relativity theory destroyed the idea of consistent objects. Extreme forms of realism in narrative began to set streams of consciousness free from the people who were having them, and the hand-holding benevolent narrator vanished. Monet began to liberate color from specific forms, and the water in which the water lilies floated became the true subject of his painting. Expressionism abolished the comforting aesthetic distances of romanticism, causing disturbing, ugly beings to crowd towards the viewer. Drawing on the breakthroughs of the phenomenologist who saw, Heidegger perhaps came closest to solving the problem within correlationism itself. Heidegger realized that the cupcakes of substance and the sprinkles of accidents were products of an objective presencing that resulted from a certain confusion within human being or Dasein, as he put it. Heidegger, however, is the one who asserts that without Dasein, it makes no sense whatsoever to talk of the truth of things, which for him implies their very existence. Only as long as Dasein is, is there being. It can neither be said that beings are or that they are not. This is the very quintessence of correlationism. The refrigerator itself, let alone the light inside it, only exists when I am there to open the door. This isn't quite Barclay and SAS per kippy, but it comes quite close. Heidegger is the one who, from within correlationism, descends to a magnificent depth, yet he is unwilling to step outside the human world correlate, and so for him, idealism, not realism, holds the key to philosophy. Quote, if the term idealism amounts to an understanding of the fact that being is never explicable by beings, but is always already the transcendental for every being, then the sole correct possibility for a philosophical problematic lies in idealism. Heidegger had his own confusion, not least of which is exemplified by his more than brush with Nazism, which is intimately related to his insight and blindness about being. Graham Harmon, to whose object-oriented ontology I now subscribe, discovered a gigantic coral reef of sparkling things beneath the Heideggerian U-boat. The U-boat was already traveling at a profound ontological depth, and any serious attempt to break through in philosophy must traverse these depths or risk being stuck in the cupcake aisle of the ontological supermarket. Heidegger was simply ready to drop, Harman was simply ready to drop the specialness of Dasein, its unique applicability to the human, in particular to German humans. This readiness is itself a symptom of the ecological era into which we have entered. To this effect, Harman was unwilling to concede Heidegger the point that the physical reality described in Newton's laws didn't exist before Newton. This line of Heidegger's thought is even more correlationist than Kant's, the second way in which Harman attacked the problem was a thorough reading of the startling tool analysis in the opening sections of Heidegger's Being and Time. This reading demonstrates that nothing in the later Heidegger, its plangency notwithstanding, topples the tool analysis from the apex of Heidegger's thinking. Heidegger, in other words, was not quite conscious of the astonishing implications of the discovery he made in the tool analysis, that when equipment, which for all intents and purposes could be anything at all, is functioning or executing, Voltzuk, it withdraws from access, Enzug, that it is only when a tool is broken that it seems to become President Hand, Vorhanden. 
This can only mean, argues Harman, that there is a vast plenum of unique entities, one of whose essential properties is withdrawal. Hence, no other entity can fully account for them. These entities must exist in a relatively flat ontology in which there is hardly any difference between a person and a pincushion, and relationships, including causal ones between them, must be vicarious and hence aesthetic in nature. The discovery of hyperobjects and object-oriented ontology are symptoms of a fundamental shaking of being, a being quake. The ground of being is shaken.